Don't expect to understand my family. You'll have better luck comprehending the history of the Middle East or a Rubik's Cube. The answers there may not be formal or finite, but they at least exist. When it comes to my family, there are a few answers. We live in North San Diego County, a casually affluent burn zone decorated by waves of red tile roofs. Here, people think they can beat the inevitable by waving magic wands, money, image, charm. Sometimes it works. Sometimes they wind up with their homes reduced to ashes. My parents have charm. They use it as a strategy, a way to beat back the flames. A grin can flash into something darker or remain in sunshine. You never know. My mother is Joan, but I occasionally call her nails. She has talons the color of blood and hair the color of rust. She is prone to crying fits and lengthy explanations. These ride on one premise. Once she had kid dreams, then she had kids. She regrets moving here from the East Coast. She claims my mother, my father forced her into it so he could pursue his perversions. He wants to do threesomes, my mother says, speaking in italics. Wife swapping. I tell him he can play a nice game of hide and go fuck yourself. My father is Steve, but I often think of him as the rooster. His comb over flaps in the wind. In the outside world, he is cordial, and at home, he can be every bit as aggressive as the barnyard animal. His eyes are as black as midnight. When they, he yells, they turn almost violet, violet and violent. Somehow, these two came together to form me and my brothers. I am 12, middle is 11, Jonathan is a year old. He is the accident, or if you'd rather be more tactful, the surprise. When he pisses me off, I call him the birth control poster child. It doesn't seem to faze him. Middle and I go to public school, but in the county's best district. In school, the teacher asks, what does your father do? My classmates answer, doctor, plumber, pro football player. Then it is my turn. He drinks beer, I say, and watches Hill Street Blues. Later, my mother explains, your father is an engineer. When I ask what that means, she shrugs. It's not as if she doesn't know. It's more like she doesn't care. I imagine him at a desk doing something called paperwork, just as he does in his den for hours with the door shut and locked. Engineers must take home a lot of work. It must be important, just as our homework is important to us. I know why work is important. It makes you money. Money means a lot to Nails and Rooster. It's how we, how we have our house, and our house is serious business. It's a style my mother calls French Country Castle. She has a name for it, Jostelajo. Joan, Steve, Allison, Middle, Jonathan. The house is a persona all its own. It is haughty in a laughable way, too big for its own britches. It prides itself on its prestige. It is high on its own square footage. But inside, it's a warren of small rooms with locks to close ourselves off one from one another. The carpet is stained and sad, the victim of roosters' dirty souls. When my mother complains, he says, what do you want from my life? Then he slams into the den and does paperwork. Our entryway is the biggest room. It's the size of some studio apartments and gives way to a dining room with no carpet. It flooded a week after we moved in, and they never bothered to replace the flooring. Bare nails jut from the concrete floor. My parents closed it off and forbade Jonathan from crawling across the room. By night, my mother retreats to her own hiding spot far from that cold entryway and dangerous dining room. All the things she and Rooster have created but cannot maintain. She locks herself in my bathroom. There she smokes, tapping her ashes into an empty yogurt cup. She writes in her journal, filling pages with her classic longhand. After the last cigarette is smoked and the room vacated, I slip into the bathroom to read her written confessions. It's a different nail than I know from during the day, my tough-talking chain smoker of a mother. This is a tender nail, a rueful one. It's a nail that makes me ache and want to read more. I too write it in a journal. It's nothing more than a spiral notebook, a series of blank lined pages. 
I use a ballpoint pen, pressing so hard that the imprint of my words can be found on the paper that lies beneath. Writing makes me feel safer than locking my door. It makes me feel more free than when Rooster is on a business trip. It makes me want to write more. I chronicle the events of the day, the credit card bill arrived and my parents bought, along with my goals. I want to meet Lucille Ball, be a cheerleader, have a boyfriend. I want to play first base on my softball team. I want to go roller skating on Saturday. Most of all, I want to be pretty. Pretty means a small waist like Scarlett O'Hara, and I love Gone with the Wind. Pretty means good hair like Madonna. Pretty means a nice smile with straight teeth, which I don't have because Rooster decided not to spend money on the braces that my orthodontist recommended. I frown into the bathroom mirror, flanked by nicotine-stained walls. I resemble nothing so much as a human chipmunk, complete with fat cheeks and wide eyebrows that meet in the middle. My crooked teeth point in all directions. My eyes are small, my nose wide, my hair is something out of Return of the Jedi, Jabba the Hutt, not Princess Leia. Pretty means thin. Beauty is slim and angular, long and lissom. Everything about my body is curved and convex, rounded and generous. My breasts are larger than most girls my age. So are my belly and behind. In the bathroom, I run my hands along the arc of my hips, the swell of my thighs. My shoulders are wide like a wide linebacker. My upper arms bulge. Even my forehead looks large, a fleshy expanse. How will I do the things I want to do if I'm fat? Lucy won't want to meet a butterball. I won't be able to fit into a cheer uniform. And no boy will love a big girl. Even I know that. I often vow to lose weight. The matter seems simple. Take in fewer calories than you burn. We learn that in health class. Losing weight is an issue of numbers, but I'm no good at math. When my parents fight, I fake a headache and skip dinner. Then I go downstairs after the table is cleared and consume chips, cookies, handfuls of cornmeal. I slather pieces of white bread with margarine and shove them into my mouth. I pour bowls of cereal and eat them dry. I belch and I smile. Sometimes I laugh. The cheeks of my face and butt are dimpled because eating makes me fat, but the food feels good. It feels familiar like a grandparent. It also hurts like <coughs> nails going down my throat. Scratchy, bloodletting. While I eat and evaluate myself, my brothers find their hiding places. Middle tucks himself in his room and watches pro wrestling, taking mental notes should he need to bust out and half Nelson on the bully next door. Jonathan, just a baby, chews on teddy bears in his crib. Outside, the sun go grows shy and the sky dark, wrapping us in nighttime as we dwell in our separate spaces. I am in seventh grade. I sit on the floor of the Black Mountain Middle School assembly room, the hard linoleum stinging my butt. The place smells like hairspray and pre-adolescent sweat. Laughter and catcalls ping off hard surfaces, making it hard to hear even if the per even the person next to me. Maybe this is what they mean when they talk about being alone in a crowded room. A voice behind me says, a werewolf. A second voice, where? Let me see. Werewolf? That's way more interesting than the German rock band that's about to perform for us. The show is meant as a history lesson, an ideal that appear, appeals more to school administrators than to us. I want to see the werewolf, too. There, first voice says. I hear the finger being pointed. Laughter gathers, blooms, and spreads. I start to join in, and then I feel that flush. It starts in my cheeks, climbs up to my forehead, and drops back down to my chin. It makes my skin feel hot and prickly, itchy. Dummy, it says, don't you know? I'm wearing a Wonder Woman t-shirt. It's pulled up and out of my jeans, exposing my lower back. I can feel eyes looking at that space. I reach back to pull my shirt down and there's hair on my back. It feels soft, but soft in this case doesn't feel good. It feels like a razor blade, actually. Tears sting my eyes, but I don't cry. Instead, I bite my lip and feel my heart slam against my ribs. I can hear its drum beat in my ears, feel it in the pulse at my wrists. It sounds like a warning. On the bus ride home, I glance down at my arms, exposed by my short sleeve Wonder Woman shirt. Harry, 
Were they his hairy all along? I edge up the leg of my jeans, hair there too. Already my body feels different, a trap rather than a tool, an object of shame rather than a point of pride. Werewolf, something that changes into something else. I think of Michael Jackson's thriller music video, his eyes going wide and dull, his features shifting from human to zombie. I'd want to change, but not like this. I want to just be beautiful. This isn't beautiful. I climb off the bus and walk down the driveway toward my house. It is a steep, sloping driveway marked by twin posts. It curves and dips and finally reaches its destination. In front is a basketball hoop and patches of dead grass. When my mother asks my father when we're getting a professional gardener, he counters, when are you getting a job? I hesitate before going in. I stand in front of my house and think what an impressive mess it is, how the external can be so deceiving. Inside, I am not a werewolf. Inside, I am a smoothly manicured girl who fits into small-sized guest jeans. Inside, I laugh at girls who look like me. The key turns with a single smooth motion. The door works. Why can't my body? I step into our massive expanse of an entryway. It is meant to impress and intimidate. Enter this house, I dare you. My heads make a strange sucking sound on the marble floor. Mom, I yell. I wonder how she'd react if I called her Joan, or God forbid, Nails. She doesn't believe in corporal punishment, but my ass wouldn't stop stinging for a week. I find my mother in the kitchen, smoking and working a crossword. What's with you, she says. I turn my back toward her and slowly roll up my shirt. Two days later, we're headed down Interstate 15 on the way to the doctor. My mother has a Benson and Hedges in her hand, in her left hand and the radio dial in her right. She drives with her knees. No reason to tell him, she says. In our house, there is only one him, and it isn't God. Why not? You're not supposed to be sick. That's why. Am I sick? That would be excellent. That would mean I could take one of the antibiotics that makes me throw up and get a rash all over my body, and the hair would fall out. If it's as easy as that, I'm happy. Dr. Fry has white hair and an unlined face. He steeples his long, narrow fingers under his pointed chin. She's here suit, he says. I don't know the term, but I can guess. It has something to do with the fuzz on my back and arms and legs, and as it turns out, on my breasts, buttocks, and face. Dummy, didn't you know? But I didn't. When you see something every day, you don't really see it. Sometimes it takes an alarm, a call. My mother puts a hand on my knee. Her grasp feels steady and almost too comforting. I want to tell her that the diagnosis itself doesn't scare me. It makes me feel warm at the temples, the pit of my throat, in the, my heart as it pounds. This doctor is going to help. He's going to fix me. We'll want to look into this, Dr. Fry said. If she were my da daughter, I'd take care of it as soon as possible. No, the diagnosis doesn't scare me. What I'm worried about is the swing into action. My parents can't even remember to water the lawn. We'll run tests, the doctor says. He marks a small sheet of paper with his physician's scribble and hands it to my mother. She grasps it with her long red claws, wrinkling the center. But instead of heading to the lab in the downstairs basement, we leave the office and walk to the car. My mother's posture is rigid, her mouth determined. She holds her purse as a soldier might hold his weapon. The sun shines on my hairy face and gorilla arms. It's peach fuzz now, but what will happen in the future? What about the blood work, I ask? I sound like a classroom goody-goody, a wannabe perfect girl. I was once called the mother of the class. I'm still trying to figure that one out. My mother hands me her purse, get my keys out, she says. She's always asking me to do these small things, get my keys, bring me a drink of water, hand me a cigarette, the pack's over there. And I never say no. The keys are jangly and jagged in my hand. I run my finger along the ragged edge of the key that opens the door to our house. I do it hard enough that it hurts. Stop fucking around, my mother says, and snatches the keys out of my hand. She can curse, but I can't. When I ask why, her answer is the same as when I ask why she can smoke, and I can't, because I'm stupid, she says. I'm not fu- I mean messing around. Neither am I, she says. Get in the car. She unlocks her door. 
Are you mad at me, I ask? Mad? Why would I be mad? I don't know. You seem mad. I'm always mad, she says. I'm a mother. She pulls her purse out of my hands and tosses it in the back seat. A bit of paper escapes and flutters to the floor. She settles herself in the driver's seat and beckons toward the passenger side door. Get in, she says. I'm still standing by the driver's side. I don't want to get in. Getting in means driving away. Driving away means no lab tests. No lab tests mean the werewolf is still alive. Yet, she repeats, in. No, I say. I'm not the kind of kid who says no. Until this moment, I wasn't sure I even knew how to do it. It feels good. It tastes like triumph. And like all sweetness, it doesn't last. I'm going to give you till the count of three, she says. And at two and a half, you're getting your ass smacked. I don't move, but already I know it's over. One, she says. Why is she so insistent? Is there a reason I shouldn't take care of what's wrong with me? Two, maybe she wants me to be the werewolf. Two and a, okay, I say. She leans over and unlocks the door. I walk around the car and fit my fingers around the handle. In my mouth is the taste of rust, the sting of defeat. Don't worry, she says. We eat lunch at Nob -Nob Hobnob Hill, surrounded by wood walls and cosseted by leather seats. My mother has the corned beef. I choose the fish fillet. I have decided to lose weight. You know, Nail says, we can take care of this ourselves. I nibble on a french fry. Losing weight can be a gradual process. You're not a freak, she says. I look up and meet her eyes. Until this moment, I'd never given thought to that idea. A freak, something out of a circus. Is she sure? You're my daughter, she says. I love you. Nails doesn't burst out, that bust out those light words lightly. She's not what you call gushy. Thanks, I say. When we come home, the house is quiet and oddly peaceful. Middle is in school. Jonathan is at a babysitter's. My father is at his Point Loma office doing paperwork. Come, my mother says. She takes me into my bathroom, her sanctuary. She retrieves a yogurt cup from underneath the sink and a cigarette from her pack. She flicks a lighter and inhales. Let me look at you, she says. I'm not going to bite. I might, I say. You've got an awfully big mouth for someone so little. I'm not that little. You're not that big either. Come here. Thank you.